Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the tragic solved murder of Jodine Sarin. And Jodi's case is definitely unlike anything that we have ever seen before. And I am very interested to see what you guys have to say about it, because even though it is a solved case, there are way more questions than there are answers. And you will understand what I mean when we get there. So with that all being said, let's jump right on into it today. Jodine or Jody Sarin was born on November 21st, 1967 in Glendale, California, which is located in Los Angeles. She was born to her parents, Arthur and Lois, and growing up, she had three sisters and two brothers. Now, even though Jody was born in Glendale, she actually grew up in Walton Hills, Ohio, and then graduated high school in 1986 at Bedford High School. Now, something to know about Jody is that she did have some mental disabilities, which in turn caused her to have some developmental delays. Now, all over the internet and in all the research that I did, I could not find exactly what those disabilities were. There's a lot of varying reports on it. There are some that say that she had schizophrenia as well as developmental delays, but you know, I don't want to put a label on something that I'm not 100% sure of. So because of that, we are just going to say that she did have some developmental delays because it's not public knowledge what exactly those were. Not that the public even needs to know that, but it is just a part of her story. However, regardless of those developmental delays, Joe did not let that stop her from having the most fulfilled life possible. And her parents especially did a phenomenal job at making sure that Jody's life was as fulfilled as it could possibly be. Jody was always surrounded by so much love from her family, her parents, her siblings, and she enjoyed doing things like going horseback riding. She actually had a white horse growing up named Sam. She also enjoyed ice skating and long walks on the beach. And luckily, Jody was able to go on lots of long walks on the beach because shortly after she graduated high school, her as well as her parents moved to Southern California, more specifically the Carlsbad area. Jody was living independently in a condo that her parents provided for her in La Costa, California. And her parents also lived in Southern California. They did not live far from her. And that was obviously on purpose because Jody's parents liked to go over and be able to check on Jody whenever they wanted or whenever she needed them. And I will say part of the reason that this case compelled me so much is because I am from Southern California. Carlsbad is not far at all from where I live. And I feel like whenever you hear about a case that happens in your hometown, it just hits you a little bit different. Now, like I said, she loved long walks on the beach. She lived in a condo in La Costa. She was also very involved in the Humane Society and in her church. She was always getting involved in these different fundraisers for various charities and loved spending time with her friends. Jody had created quite a good core group of people and her parents were very familiar with those friends as well. Now, something that Jody was extremely passionate about, which I just thought was the coolest thing ever, was actually making flower arrangements. And once her and her family moved to Carlsbad, Jody actually got her certificate in floral design, which I had no idea was even a thing but I think that that is the coolest thing ever. And she got her certificate to do that professionally. So this case begins in 2007. Jody was actually 39 years old. And despite her developmental delays, like I said, she was highly functioning and she was able to live on her own because of that. Her neighbors described her as a pretty much all around perfect neighbor, the most ideal neighbor that one would want. She was very friendly, very nice whenever she 
she saw anyone, but for the most part, she really kept to herself. She had a very low profile, but she was very, very sweet. And like I said, Jody's parents would come and check in on her either every day or every other day, every couple days. Jody wasn't able to drive, so her parents would oftentimes drive her to different doctor's appointments or wherever she needed to go. And if she wasn't being driven around by her parents, she typically was taking public transportation. And if there ever was a time that she didn't actually physically see her parents, if her parents didn't come over, she always was in communication with them via either text messages or phone calls. And I know I'm making a very big stressor over the fact that she was constantly with her parents, but that was because she was in constant communication with her parents up until February 14th, 2007. So that was actually valentine's day now on this night lois and arthur had gone out to dinner to celebrate valentine's day together and their plan was they were going to go to dinner and then they were going to go to a movie to kind of cap off their night However, throughout the entirety of it, dinner and the movie, Lois said that she just had this gut instinct that something was wrong with Jody. Neither Lois nor Arthur had actually heard from Jody since the night prior. And like I said earlier, that was not normal whatsoever. So Lois and Arthur decided that after their movie was over, they were going to go over to Jody's condo and just check in and make sure everything was okay. So their movie ended at about 10 o'clock PM. And that is when they drove over to Jody's condo. Now, once Lois and Arthur arrived to Jody's condo, they started knocking on the door several times. However, they did not get an answer. However, luckily, they both had spare keys to Jody's condo, and so even though she did not answer the door when they knocked, they were able to get into the condo via the spare key. So once they opened the door with the spare key, the door actually wouldn't fully open because the chain was still on the latch. I'm sure you guys have seen on a lot of doors, just for example, take a hotel. They usually have two sets of locks on a door. You have the lock that locks the doorknob, then you have the chain lock that's a little bit higher than that. So you have two ways to lock the door. And so even though the doorknob was now unlocked and they were able to open the door, they couldn't fully open it because that chain was still on the latch. But even though they couldn't open the door fully at that point, they were able to see that all of the lights were on in the condo. And so they started calling Jody's name over and over again. However, they were not getting an answer. So ultimately, Lois and Arthur decided that they needed to break that door down, which is exactly what they did. A direct quote from Lois is actually, quote, the lights were on, everything seemed normal. We were thinking she was in bed or in the shower, unquote. However, unfortunately, that was not the case. Once they finally got into the condo, they started looking around a little bit and went up to Jody's bedroom. Now, Jody's bedroom door was shut and at first they knocked but got no answer. Then they finally pushed the door open only to be mortified. Now, when they opened the door, they saw a half-dressed man on top of Jody in her bed. Now, when this happened, Jody's parents initially assumed that they had just walked in on a consensual moment between Jody and someone that she knew. So they apologized for walking in and were kind of embarrassed and said that they would wait for the two of them out in the living room and ask them both to stop what they were doing, get changed, and come out. And this was a very quick interaction. I feel like I have to emphasize that. Neither Lois nor Arthur was able to get a very good look of the man that was in their daughter's bedroom, and Jody wasn't saying anything either. It was just a very quick interaction. So her parents quickly walked out of Jody's room and waited in the living room, and minutes went by, and neither Jody nor the man came out. And once a considerable amount of time had passed, her parents again began knocking on the bedroom door and told them to come out. However, they didn't hear anything on the other side of the door so they decided to open it again and what they found will shock you now when they opened the door they found that jody was lying in her bed however the man was gone and when jody's parents reached for her in her bed they realized that she 
was dead. Jody had been strangled to death and bludgeoned over her head. Her father picked her up out of bed and placed her on the ground and started to perform CPR. However, it was too late. Jody had actually been dead for a couple hours at that point, which means that when her parents walked into her bedroom for the first time, what they thought was a consensual act between Jody and this man was actually necrophilia. Jody's parents had quite literally walked in on their daughter's killer having sex with her lifeless body. Now her parents immediately called authorities and when they arrived they did a full examination of the house. They were quickly able to realize that there was no sign of forced entry. Now you might be sitting here wondering how on earth did this man manage to escape out of Jody's apartment if her parents were waiting in the living room. Now, what ended up happening is when Lois and Arthur walked out of Jody's bedroom, they were waiting in an area of the condo that actually wasn't visible to her bedroom and to the front door. So this man was actually able to sneak out of Jody's bedroom and out the front door past Jody's parents and run away. Now, nothing in Jody's condo was missing, which was able to rule out robbery. However, luckily, there was DNA found of an unknown male on Jody's body. However, when police ran it through their database, they found no matches. Now, police also spoke to neighbors in the area. However, the only piece of information they were able to get came from one of Jody's neighbors who said that they saw an unknown man running down an embankment near Jody's apartment apartment around the time that she was murdered, but due to how fast he was running, she wasn't able to get a clear picture of his face, but she said he definitely looked like he was running away from something. Now, at first, Arthur said that when he walked in the room and saw Jody and this man, again, it was a very quick glimpse. Arthur initially thought that this man was one of Jody's friends that she had met through that circle of friends that I was mentioning earlier. Arthur told police the name of the specific guy that he thought it was. He also said that this guy did not have a car and he would either get around by bus or by bicycle. So that's where authorities started. And luckily, they already had that unknown male DNA found at the crime scene. So all they really had to do was match DNA now. It was just a matching game at this point to see whose DNA was going to match the one that was found on Jody. And so when police got a hold of this guy that Arthur was talking about, he was able to give up his DNA. And that is how they were able to figure out that it was not the same guy. So he was ruled out. Now, all Jody's parents were really able to remember of this guy was that he was a heavier set man with a large stomach and disheveled hair. He stood anywhere from five foot eight to six feet tall and years and years went by after Jody's murder and nothing really came out of it. However, luckily, as we've seen in cases prior, other cases that we have covered, the advancements in DNA technology have been so extreme and luckily it's been able to bring closure to some of these cases and 10 years later in february 2017 that is exactly what happened here before we move any further i do want to take a second and thank our sponsors for today's video Nowadays, small businesses don't seem all that small, and you really can't afford to miss out on opportunities to grow and keep your customers wanting more. Time really is money, and you don't want to waste any time with trips to the post office. But with Stamps.com, you can skip the trip and focus on how to take your small business to the next level. Stamps.com lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process, so you can spend less time at the post office and more time making your customers happy. Stamps.com saves you time, money, and stress. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Stamps.com gives you access to all the post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer. With Stamps.com, you get discounts that you won't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. You guys, I cannot even begin to explain how much time Stamps.com has saved me. I 
am not a fan of the post office and the fact that I don't have to go anymore thanks to stamps.com is a lifesaver, truly. Now stop overpaying for shipping with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code KILLER. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill and take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply just forgot about. And on average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. You guys, I've told you this before. I used to have to sit down with my family every single month and go over all of our subscriptions, what we're paying for, how to get out of it, who's going to get us out of it, and Truebill has saved us all of that hassle. With Truebill, my family was able to save $745. And don't just take it from me, because Truebill has over 2 million users and has helped save them over 100 million dollars. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash killer. Go right now, truebill.com slash killer and it could save you thousands a year truebill.com slash killer did you guys know that one of the root causes of aging targets all the cells in your body life cannot exist without nad nad is an essential molecule found in all living cells and as you age nad can decline by as much as 50 percent due to exposure to several stressors and that includes lack of sleep sun exposure smoking and alcohol consumption etc and this can have wide ranging effects on your body and and organs, especially as you age. But that's where true niogen comes in. True niogen is one of the most advanced forms of inner body aging science that is proven to increase NID. True niogen is researched by the top institutions in the world and has sold over 3 million bottles and has the excess of 200 published scientific studies. Taking it daily helps support muscle and heart health and energy production in your cells to help you age better. Now, since taking true niogen, my mind is at peace knowing that my cells are being taken care of by a brand that is backed by science. Right now, new customers can save 20% on their first purchase by going to trueniagen.com slash killer and use code killer. That's T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N.com slash killer, code killer, to save 20% on your first purchase. trueniagen.com slash killer, code killer. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Now, a lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about, We'll go out of our way to treat other people well, but how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? This is where I want to talk to you guys about BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million and people have used BetterHelp online therapy. You guys, I have been in therapy for pretty much as long as I can remember, and I am a huge advocate for it. I think that we can always do things to better ourselves and just improve our life and our mindset. And so I really have enjoyed working with BetterHelp. And they have counselors that are specialized in so many different areas, such as anxiety, depression, LGBTQ plus matters, family conflicts, sleeping conflicts. They have it all. And if for whatever reason you don't like the counselor that you were matched with, BetterHelp will provide you a new one free of charge. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Killer Instinct listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash instinct. Again, that's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash instinct. So to really help solve this case, the San Diego Police Department had been using a technology that a Virginia-based DNA tech company had specialized in. Now, this company is a lab that is called Parabon Nano Labs, and Parabon Nano Labs specializes in DNA phenotyping. Now, this is something that, like I said, we have seen before other labs do this. However, the San Diego Police Department did team up with Parabon Nano Labs for this particular case. Now, what phenotyping really means is it's when you take a piece of DNA that was left behind at a crime scene, 
the lab is actually able to take that piece of DNA and convert it and predict what someone's physical appearance looks like. So their hair color, their eye color, their skin color, as well as what their ancestry is. And this is the same technology that was used to find the Golden State Killer, which is a case I'm sure you guys are familiar with, just to give you a general idea that this is something that has been used for a while now. And it's kind of crazy to think of how advanced technology has gotten to the point where all we need is a piece of someone's DNA to really create a picture of what they look like. Now, when the San Diego Police Department teamed up with Parabon Nano Labs, they had no suspects at all. So it wasn't like they were looking at a group of two or five or 10 people and trying to narrow it down. For Jody's case, they still were at zero for any persons of interest, for any suspects, they had no one. So looking to Parabon Nano Labs to try and use the phenotyping was really their last resort here. So when police used this technology, they came up with a profile for what they believed their suspect looked like. They said that based on the predictions, the man who was responsible for Jody's murder either had green or blue eyes, he had dark blonde or light brown hair, and he also had freckles on his face. It was said that he was likely between the ages of 30 and 40 years old and was of Northern European descent. So more likely than not, he was going to be white. Now a composite picture was made up and publicly released and there was also an award of $52,000 for any information that was leading to an arrest in this case. Now you might be sitting there wondering, does this really narrow anything down? Because there are a lot of blue slash green eyed and light brown haired guys guys in the world, let alone just in California itself, I can attest to that. So it wasn't actually the composite sketch that really helped narrow down this search. It was actually the DNA matching technology that solved this. Now with this specific type of technology, not only are you able to come up with a visualization of what someone is going to look like, you're also going to be able to see their ancestry through their DNA. And that is what really helped solve this case. Because when the unknown male's DNA was put into the system and into the database, it didn't necessarily come up with a direct match for the killer itself. However, it did show that he had a son. Now authorities were able to track down his son as well as his ex-wife. His son was 18 years old at the time and both of them agreed to share their DNA. And what's interesting was that this man and his ex-wife had actually divorced in 2007, which was the same year that Jody's murder occurred. Now authorities took the DNA from his ex-wife as well as from this man's son. And when they did that, they were basically able to positively identify who this man was. And ultimately in November of 2018, it narrowed them down to a man named David Mabrito. So this case was actually recently solved in the past four years. An investigation Investigators were a thousand percent sure it was him because the technology said that it was a one and 64 quintillion. Yes, that was with a Q, quintillion match. So there is no probability that it could be anyone else. Now the police had their guy, so you would think it was time to make an arrest. However, unfortunately, David died only four years after the murder in 2011, and he was 38 years old at the time that he killed Jody, and he was 42 at the time that he died, and he actually committed suicide. Now, who is David Mabrito? You might be wondering. From what we know and what I could find, he was born in San Antonio, Texas. He has only one child, the one that helped actually solve this case. And like I said before, he died in 2011. And I do want to emphasize that his ex-wife and his child were really the reason that this case was solved. And the DA actually honored both of them for handing off their DNA and honored their bravery in a whole ceremony. So it was a, it was a big deal. Now, you might be sitting here wondering, did Jody and David know each other? Because how in the world did they cross paths? How did this happen? And through all of police's research, they discovered that there was no evidence that David or Jody ever knew each other. So it's not known how they crossed paths and whether or not Jody was a random attack 
or a crime of opportunity for David. So like I said in the beginning, even though we have the who did it in this case, we have nothing else to go off of. And unfortunately, because David took his own life before he was able to face justice for taking someone else's, that's really all we have to go off of. And when David took his own life, he took all of those answers selfishly with him. Now, I do want to talk about theories in this case, because even though, again, we know who did this, it really got me thinking, how did this happen? How did we get here? And there are a couple theories that I have come up with in my head as to how this could have happened. And so I want to share those with you and I want to hear your theories as well. Now, the first thought that I had was the fact that it could have been possible that Jody and David crossed paths on public transportation. They both could have been on the bus one day. David also could have been a friend of someone who was living in the condo and saw Jody and took interest to her. The fact that there was no sign of forced entry makes me believe that Jody was expecting David or that David had taken advantage of Jody's developmental delay and had maybe knocked on her door pretending to be, you know, maintenance or someone that needed to come in and check on something and Jody believed him. However, when you think about it like that, you have to think that David knew who he was dealing with and would have known to target her specifically. Now, the fact that nothing was stolen from Jody's house has made police believe that this was not a robbery. However, maybe it was supposed to be a robbery. And the fact that Jody's parents came in and he realized he couldn't take anything with him. But then again, the reason that I don't believe that this was a robbery was because if this was supposed to be a robbery gone wrong, typically you don't see robbery gone wrong situations end in necrophilia. Typically, if it is a robbery gone wrong, you might have the intruder murder the person whose home it is. However, they're not going to go to the extent of committing an act of necrophilia. And the fact that Jody was dead for hours before police arrived and hours before her parents arrived shows that David David was with Jody for hours after he murdered her. Now, another theory I have, and this may be a stretch, however, it was Valentine's Day. Is it possible that Jody and David ran into each other during the day and they made plans for David to come over to Jody's apartment later that night? We don't really know what Jody's day looked like the day that she was murdered because no one really talked to her that day. Her parents didn't talk to her that day. No one really spoke with her. So no one knows what exactly Jody's day looked like leading up to her murder. However, is it possible that maybe she was on a beach walk or maybe she took the bus somewhere and ran into David and maybe they did a last minute Valentine's Day date that ultimately led to Jody's death. Now Jody's murder also makes you wonder if David has done something like this before or if Jody was his first victim. Now typically repeat offenders are very meticulous and they have their routine and they usually don't leave DNA behind, hence why they're repeat offenders and typically don't get caught. However, because David got caught in the middle of the act, maybe he got spooked and he wasn't being very careful about not leaving any trace left behind. Now personally, I find it hard to believe that David wouldn't be someone who has done this before because I have find it hard to believe that you go from never killing someone a day in your life to committing necrophilia. It just seems like a very big, big jump. Is it impossible? No. Is it possible that this was his first time? Yes. However, like I said, Jody had been dead for hours by the time that she had been found. So David spent time with her while she was dead. So those are just a bunch of theories that have been rolling around in my head. I'm not exactly sure what I believe, but I am very interested to hear what you guys have to say. And you can't even begin to imagine or try and wrap your head around how Jody's parents must have felt in that situation. They quite literally walked into the room that their daughter was murdered in and came face to face with her killer. However, out of respect for their daughter and respecting her privacy and thinking 
that, you know, they walked in on an intimate moment, a consensual intimate moment. They turned around and just tried to make it as normal as possible for Jody. And to this day, her parents will not stay in Carlsbad on Valentine's Day. They leave town for that time because it is just too painful to be there around that time and to have to relive the horror that they lived that day. Now that, you guys, is the case of Jody Sarin, and I am so curious to hear what you guys have to say about this one and your theories on this one, because even though it is solved, there are so many unanswered questions, and we probably will never get the answers to those questions, which is even more infuriating. However, I just, I need to know what you guys think about this one. So let me know in the comments below if you're watching me on YouTube, or you can email me at killerinstinctpodcast at gmail.com. But with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube and you're not going to want to miss it. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys and until then stay safe. Bye guys. Bye.